inauguration would not be an inauguration without a lecture. Yes. Uh, you don't have to take notes. You want to be tested on this information. Uh, Professor Kenneth Stickers, who comes to us from University of Southern Illinois, is from the Department of Philosophy and Africana Studies. Uh, very unusual combination, yes. Uh, it's one of the unique departments of philosophy in, in, in America, as we hear, that doesn't just teach you to philosophize and read texts by wise men and women, uh, but uh, it, it teaches you how to use it in practical life, as I understand, as yes. Professor Stickers his history in the academe is so long, not because he's so old, yes, but because he's such an accomplished scholar. Yes. He's a friend of Warsaw University, I think he's been here for four times, at least five, yes, and, and he agreed to uh, talk to a talk. We call it a lecture, but it's more of a talk about the meaning of America. I wonder if there are any Monty Python fans in the in the audience. You remember the film, The Meaning of Life. Yes. So let's let's hope it's another chapter in that film that consisted of small short episodes. So now it's the the another episode in the meaning of life called The Meaning of America. And I give you Professor Ken Stickers and his understanding of America. Thank you, Let me add my uh, welcome to the new students and the returning students. Uh, let me, in American fashion, uh, continue with another commercial, uh, and that is uh, for my own institution, Southern Illinois University may not be as well known to you as other American universities, but it is widely regarded as the preeminent program in American philosophy in the world. Uh, and that is because uh, of its hosting a major research uh, institute in American studies, and that is the Center for John Dewey Studies, where we have the papers of what many consider the greatest uh, American intellectual, uh, John Dewey. Uh, so those of you who might be interested in uh, American philosophy of education, might be interested in uh, American thoughts on democracy, these would be primary topics that would be uh, very well researched and followed up on. Uh, but our uh, university also uh, has a marvelous uh, archive of material and other aspects of American culture. For example, we are in the center of the Midwest uh, and uh, which was the site of many of the utopian experiments that grew up particularly in the 19th century. So many of the papers from those various experiments uh, are housed in our, uh, in, in our archives. So I want you to be, be thinking about, uh, about that and while I'm here we're hoping to explore uh, further collaborations between our, our uh, institutions. Uh, so any of you who uh, might be, be interested in, in coming to Southern Illinois University, uh, you're welcome to contact me. Uh, also, the course that I'll be teaching, uh, History of American Philosophy from Puritanism to Pragmatism. It will be an overview of the history of American philosophy, hoping to provide a foundation for more specialized uh, studies. Uh, any of you who are interested are welcome to uh, attend, sit in on uh, lectures. We meet Tuesday and Wednesday morning at 9.45. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the uh, commercial. Now, as indicated, uh, yes, I am uh, principally a philosopher presently, but I began my graduate studies in uh, American studies uh, at the very first program uh, of American studies, and that was at the University of Minnesota. And my chief professor was the uh, uh, Professor Joseph Quiet, who had the distinction of the first PhD in uh, uh, American studies. Uh, so I, uh, I continue to uh, approach American philosophy really within the context of a broader sense of American studies, that is, the philosophy as situated within the larger culture of America, looking at how that culture uh, 
helped to shape the philosophy, but how the philosophy in turn helped to shape the culture, that, that dialectical relationship between uh, philosophy and the larger uh, culture. So uh, yes, my, the, the main question in what American studies has uh, meant to me um, has really been this, uh, this question that I propose to talk about a little bit today. Uh, what is the meaning uh, of America? And, and by that, I mean on multiple levels. Uh, first of all, how are we to understand uh, America historically? What is the meaning of America within the context of world histories, uh, uh, first of all? Uh, but also on a personal level, uh, what does it mean to, um, to be an American? Uh, what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to experience oneself as an American? Uh, and, but also then, if you are not American, what does it mean to identify someone as American? So uh, I would you know, invite you to consider those occasions in which you might say of uh, an American, or as it could be somebody who's not an American, oh, that's so typically American. Uh, and anybody want to offer anything? What would you say that in response to? Well, that's so typically American. Go ahead. <laughs> Come on, you must have a thought. Equal opportunity. Equal opportunity. Equal opportunity. Okay. There is equal. Inequality. Inequality. Okay, interesting. Because this is actually going to be one of the themes I hit on. Is the meaning of America is perhaps lying in its contradictions as much as in its continuities. Uh, that uh, not the way we see this today. Uh, your very point, right? Historically, yes, America has uh, often been identified as a land of equality. Uh, but we know that America ranks near the top of nations in terms of its inequality today. How does one explain that? Uh, how does one explain that, the present day reality over against this uh, historical uh, you know, sense and uh, you know, commitment to uh, equality? So let me uh, address this question um, both as a, uh, a scholar of American studies, but also as, uh, as, as an American. Um, so first of all, uh, as I just suggested, um, it, it's, it's common, it has been common, I think for many years, to talk about the, the, the meaning of a culture, whether it be American or otherwise, in terms of continuities, to try to identify the continuities. For example, what is it that all, or at least most, Americans believe, for example? And, and that would be sort of the uh, clue as to what a particular culture uh, might mean. But I think more recent historiography has suggested that the meanings of cultures um, are found at, at least as much in the uh, the discontinuities and contradictions of the culture as much as in the continuities. And so one of my first suggestions here is that in your quest to find the meaning of America, which I hope in some way you are all uh, interested in, uh, that you look for, for those. So from the very beginning, one of the central contradictions uh, that one finds throughout uh, American history, I believe, stems from its two main intellectual sources, namely Puritanism and the Enlightenment. And one fruitful way of reading American history, uh, I believe, particularly its intellectual history, is in terms of the uh, ongoing tension between these two uh, uh, intellectual uh, uh, sources. That, um, However, if one were to uh, identify, um, search for continuities, uh, one of the candidates for a central continuity in American culture is this idea of uh, American exceptionalism. Uh, how many are familiar with that concept, American exceptionalism? Oh, OK. Um, I, Therefore, let me, let me suggest that you look very, very carefully at this, because I would identify it, certainly, and I think many scholars would, would, would point to it as one of the features uh, that is uh, most central to the understanding of American culture. 
American exceptionalism is this idea that America is unique among nations. And this has a theological origin. It goes back to the Puritan roots of America. The idea that America is divinely ordained, that America is the land of God's chosen people, the place where God has gathered his chosen people. An extraordinary idea, isn't it? Extraordinary idea. America as the new Israel, that just as, uh, as, as Israel uh, uh, constituted the people of a special covenant with God, the early American Puritans talk of, of themselves as the new Israel, the people of this new covenant, a special relationship with God. Now, this expresses itself in many ways. For example, it's uh, held by, and it's taught in the, in the high school textbooks even, that the American Constitution is a divinely inspired document. And the Puritans, in fact, even believe that their histories, the history of their coming to America, would constitute a third, bi a third book of the Bible. So you'd have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the American Testament. Extraordinary idea, isn't it? Uh, it uh, cashes out, too, in the idea that somehow the, the rest of the world wants to be like America, wants to emulate America. We saw this, for example, immediately after the September 11th uh, attacks. You know, many um, saw or heard the immediate response of President Bush when he tried to explain why was America attacked. Anybody know what was his answer? They were jealous of us. They wanted to be like us, but couldn't be like us, and therefore, out of resentment, attacked us. That was President Bush's explanation for the September 11 attacks. All going back to this notion of American exceptionalism. America as unique in the history of the world, America as having a special divine mission, America as a nation constituted under God. Now, personally, I think this is an extraordinary dangerous myth. Extraordinarily dangerous. Because on the one hand, and many have argued, it has inspired um, some great things, perhaps, but on the other hand, I think it has also inspired or been at the root of much of the evil that America has committed. I think, first of all, of the Vietnam War, uh, which, which was a major challenge to this myth of American exceptionalism and why Americans don't want to talk about it, uh, but also uh, in the invasion of, uh, of, of Iraq. That, um, that uh, in many instances, I think I take these as uh, exceptions, that America it has seen itself as being able to do what it would never allow other nations to do, invade other countries on the other side of the world and so forth. So that's my, my own view, but it nonetheless is one of the central uh, myths that defines, I think, the meaning of America. And uh, there are many authors who claim that, in fact, the very divide between conservatives and liberals is over this issue. There are many who have claimed that conservatives are defined as those who believe in American exceptionalism, whereas liberals do not. That's how central this idea is uh, in American culture, that it's, uh, it's pointed to as defining uh, America, the, the defining principle of, uh, of American politics. Now, shortly into his uh, first term as president, President Obama, in fact, uh, got into a great deal of trouble at one point because he was asked by a uh, journalist, do you believe President Obama in American exceptionalism? And he answered in a way that many Americans found unacceptable. He answered by saying, says, well, I believe in American exceptionalism in the same way that the English might believe in English exceptionalism, or that Poles might believe in Polish exceptionalism. Doesn't every culture think of itself as exceptional in some way? And he was severely criticized for this um, because he didn't 
don't go far enough. Uh, and uh, some, uh, some of the critics said, well, yes, other nations think they're exceptional, but only America really is exceptional. That's how deep this idea is. Again, an idea that I think has been a very, very dangerous uh, idea in American history, but as I uh, suggested, uh, a very uh, powerful one. Now, uh, because Obama experienced uh, such criticism for his answer in this uh, fact of, as to whether he believed in American exceptionalism, he later modified his answer. And he offered his own version of American exceptionalism. And it's something that he continues to say often to this day. And that is that only in America is a story like his possible. Only in America is a story like his possible. And we take that to be the story of someone who comes from rather humble origins, especially as an, uh, an African American, and rises to the highest office uh, in the land, and suggesting that this would be uh, perhaps unheard of uh, you know, uh, elsewhere. Uh, this was is his own version then of, of American exceptionalism, but that version hinges uh, or connects with another concept that is often identified as one of the central continuities of American culture, and that's the whole idea of the American dream whole uh, the American dream. The first American dream uh, was offered by those early Puritans in their vision that they had for America. And it's articulated in the very famous sermon by uh, Jonathan Winthrop, the leader of the early uh, Puritans in the Massachusetts Bay uh, Colony, in which he offered this vision of America as the city on a hill, as the, a model to the world of true Christianity. America for him, and this is in uh, 1630, he, uh, that America to him offered this possibility of being a model to the world of Christianity, of Christian charity. America would show the world what true Christianity would be. After all, as I mentioned earlier, it, this, these early Puritans saw themselves as God's chosen people, called by God to come to America to create the heavenly city on earth, the model of the Christian life. Now, the term itself, um, uh, American dream, however, was first coined by the, uh, the historian James Truslow Adams and uh, in his book, The Epic of America. And for those of you, well, really, uh, especially if you're beginning the program, but really for any American Studies student, I cannot think of a better place to begin American Studies than with uh, this chapter. It's actually the epilogue of Adams' book, the Epic of America, in which he famously, in 1931, introduced the concept of the American dream. And there he tells us that the American dream, which he suggests could be traced all the way back to the beginning, is fundamentally a belief that in America, life could be better in the sense of a richer, fuller life. That in America, people could come and live a richer and fuller life than they might experience by remaining in their home country. And he warned that the American dream should not be viewed as, quote, faster motor cars, bigger houses, and fancier clothes. He thought that that was a debased, a degenerate form of the American dream that rather it must be a dream about a richer, fuller life in more than just material, consumeristic terms. That um, he feared, though, that America had failed to reach any kind of consensus about what a richer, fuller life was. And that, of course, is a profoundly philosophical question. What is a rich and full life? What, you know, not just what does it mean to be rich 
in terms of wealth, but what does it mean to live a rich and full life? Profound philosophical question. And Adams thought that America had failed to reach any meaningful consensus about that was, and therefore, the American dream had devolved into this degenerate, crass materialism and consumerism, and had become defined precisely by those things we mentioned, faster motor cars, bigger houses, and fancier clothes. And that this degeneration of the American dream, he feared, would be a major threat to American democracy, which had fostered the American dream. He saw this as the greatest threat to American democracy, the fact that crass consumerism and materialism had come to define the American dream, that people would become more preoccupied with their fancy things than with ideals of freedom, liberty, equality, and so forth. That they simply wouldn't have time for these things because they were too busy becoming wealthy. Well, many of us worry that, uh, uh, Adams speaking in 1931, that uh, this prophecy perhaps has come true. That perhaps that is the story uh, of, uh, of, of America. So those are some of the continuities that I would suggest, two of the deep continuities that one might look for in defining and trying to understand the meaning of America, this idea of American exceptionalism and the idea of the American dream. But uh, at the beginning, though, I suggested that we might also look for the meaning uh, of a culture generally and the meaning of America in particular by looking at the contradictions, the inconsistencies the uh, arguments that take place within that culture. So we might ask, what is it that Americans argue about and disagree about? Uh, well, one of the extraordinary things is that we disagree about climate change. And the people from outside the United States say, how, how could there possibly be any disagreement about whether or not climate change is taking place, and yet uh, that's, uh, that is the case, and why the United States lags behind any other industrial nations in uh, dealing with that matter. Um, we could also ask in this regard, uh, what do we avoid talking about? What are the things that are so sensitive and uh, provoke uh, such uh, often pain that we just don't want to talk about it. Uh, well, one, I mentioned already, Vietnam. Americans don't want to talk about Vietnam, in part, as I suggested, because it was such a challenge uh, to the American dream. Um, an example of that would be the, the film, uh, the, the, uh, the Deer Hunter. Yeah, I've seen that. I think it uh, depicts this very well. Um, but more recently, uh, Iraq. Americans don't want to talk about uh, Iraq because it, bringing up Iraq clearly brings up that the decision to invade that country um, was most likely the source of much of the unrest that we're seeing uh, now, the rise of ISIS, uh, the uh, uh, problem with immigration, and so forth. And so uh, we find that most Americans don't want to talk about it. So, um, some of the other inconsistencies uh, that one finds when one looks at, at uh, an America, uh, at America, I mean, just a way of, of observation. One that's pointed to is this. Uh, America is, by many measures, the most religious industrial nation in the world, as measured by percentage of people who say they believe in God, who attend church regularly, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, uh, identify with a religious, uh, established uh, uh, religion. Um, but for some, this is in stark contrast to the fact that uh, America is also the most violent uh, industrial nation as measured by uh, the ownership of guns, guns per capita, greater than any nation in the world, homicide rates, 
highest of any industrial nation. The rate of incarceration, America boasts the highest rate of incarceration of any nation of the world, industrial or not. Uh, the second leading nation is North Korea, and actually lags fairly far behind the United States. So for some, this is a puzzle. How can such a professed religious people have such problems on the, on the other hand? There's tension, inconsistency, how are we to see this? But I offer this as an example of what I mean by perhaps we can find the meaning of a culture, the meaning of America, in these at least seeming contradictions and inconsistencies. We mentioned earlier uh, equality, a, a professed commitment to equality and yet boasting one of the highest rates of inequality in, in the world. How could a nation that on one hand, I think um, uh, that uh, uh, on some occasions at least, at least stood, I believe, as an American and proudly, stood nobly for human freedom and human dignity in some instances, but also was guilty of some of the worst acts of barbarism, namely the genocide against Native American people and participation in the slave trade, the fact that for so long we had a slave-based uh, economy. How do we understand these extremes? And I think most cultures we can identify, we look at most cultures, we can identify strange tensions and seeming contradictions. But uh, I invite you to look specifically in the uh, American sense. Another way of getting at the meaning of America, though, then, is in, in the context I just described, is to look at, well, what is it, uh, what, what do Americans feel proud of, but also ashamed of? What makes one proud of one's country, but then also what makes one feel ashamed? And often you have what Thomas Paine called sunshine patriots, and that is those who only want to think about the things that make them proud, but I don't think you can separate the one from the other. If one wants to feel proud of one's nation and one's heritage, I think one also has to face up to and take some responsibility for those, uh, those uh, episodes in one's history that are uh, embarrassing and even, even shameful. That, um, um, what, what, um, if one were to ask, what, is, uh, what have been America's greatest moments? And what have there, has been America's greatest moments of shame? The African-American intellectual, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, for example, in his uh, famous history of uh, Reconstruction, the period following the American Civil War, identified that period as America's greatest moment. It says he wrote that at that time, the, that America put the full weight of its army, of the army of the Republic, behind the famous promise of Thomas Jefferson of, uh, of America as freedom and equality for all. Then and only then do we see in American history, according to Du Bois, a full commitment to those ideals expressed in the American Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson, that human beings are born free and equal. So, I mean, as an American, for me, um, moments of pride um, include visiting Concord, the cornfields, the fields, the farm fields of Concord, when a small band of farmers took up arms, had had enough, and took up arms against the greatest army in the world at that time, Great Britain. This is a source of tremendous pride, even though my family had not, not yet arrived in America. How does one explain that? I don't know. I'm not sure how one explains it. Uh, similarly, um, uh, setting the beaches of Normandy. I think these were great moments in the meaning of, of, of America. And there you have an uncle who uh, was severely wounded in that invasion of the beaches of Normandy. On the other hand, though, I find myself brought to tears and brought to my knees in shame when I visit the site of Wounded Knee, the site of the last battle with Native American people. 
or when I uh, visited a reconstructed slave ship and stood in its hall. I was overwhelmed with tears and shame at being an American. How could my country have allowed this to happen? Now, hopefully that's not you know, the ultimate word about the meaning of, uh, of America. Right? So that's my, my further suggestion, is to look not only for continuities, but also these uh, discontinuities, these seeming contradictions and ruptures, and not just at the continuities. What is it that divides Americans as well as what seems to unify them? Let me close then by offering another uh, suggestion. And that is, if we ask, uh, when I uh, ask the question, well, what is the most commonly shared experience among Americans? I would suggest that it's the experience of displacement. The experience of displacement. That is, to be American, and except for a very, very small group of people, means to be from somewhere else. To come from somewhere else. And this is even true for the majority of Native Americans, because even Native Americans were displaced, removed from their traditional lands, and relocated into reservations. So I would submit that the, 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 the one experience that is most commonly shared by Americans is this experience of displacement, of being uprooted either by choice or by force. Okay. Now, in this regard, I was strongly influenced by uh, one of my teachers of American studies, the uh, historian David Noble, whose works I would highly recommend to you, really one of the most important uh, intellectual historians uh, of America, who offered the thesis that America could be understood as the movement of a people out of place, that is, out of their historically and culturally traditional place into space, a space of open opportunity, seeming open opportunity. This is the experience of being an American, of being displaced, uprooted from a traditional place uh, into the space, open space, of the new world. Now, out of this experience of displacement, then, one can see two different reactions. You can celebrate that displacement. You can celebrate the seeming freedom of not being feeling tied to a place, the place defined by tradition and custom and ancestry and so forth. You can celebrate that. You see that in figures like Walt Whitman, Jack Kerouac, and so forth. The celebration of placelessness. And that is a feature of American culture, I would submit. The celebration of placelessness. The feeling that one can go anywhere, that one can reinvent oneself, that one can you know, pick up and leave and go and find a new place, a new home, create a new identity for oneself, and so forth. That, I think, has been part of the American experience. But the other reaction possible reaction to this experience of displacement is to lament the loss, to long for community. And this, I think, is also one of the deep structures of what it means to be an American. There's a longing for a home, a longing for a home, a longing for a place, a longing for community. Uh, and so much of American history I think uh, it can be seen as the effort to recreate this lost sense of community. And so you have the utopian experiments that uh, sprung up, but you also have these planned communities in the suburban areas of, of the United States, the attempts to create perfect communities. Right? So uh, one of the, uh, out of these two possible responses then to the experience of, of displacement um, as um, uh, another tension, central tension of uh, American life. On the one hand, America's individualism. And so much of what it means to be an American is to assert your individuality, how you are unique, 
and distinct and separate and independent of everyone else. That's why we've been so slow in developing a policy of national health care, because the predominant mythology is that each individual should be responsible for his or her own health. And much the rest of the world looks on in disbelief. You know, how, how could such an industrial nation be so behind and so uh, inept at providing proper health care uh, for its uh, population? So a lot of it comes from this sense of individualism, the celebration of rootlessness. We are each our own person. But on the other hand, there's this longing for the community. And so a number of social histories have identified uh, as a uh, sorry, distinct but uh, unique in its degree the experience of loneliness. So you have authors beginning perhaps with David Reisman, his book The Lonely Crowd. Philip Slater's The Pursuit of Loneliness, and now more recently, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, uh, which describe this central paradox or tension in American culture. That is, the extraordinary efforts that Americans go to to assert their individuality, their independence, their separateness from one another, but then complain that they're lonely more than any other nation of my just about you know, psychological studies, Americans complain more than any other people that they're lonely. Is that a surprise when one works so hard to be separate, distinct, separate, independent of others? And so I submit that that is, that is another central uh, tension that uh, ultimately I think can be rooted to this experience of displacement. One might celebrate it, but one might also long bemoan uh, the loss of a sense of, of, of community. All right, so uh, let me simply end by, uh, again, uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention. Uh, good luck to all of you. Welcome to new students. And uh, I thank you for having me here on this uh, occasion. Stickers delivered a perfect introductory lecture. Yes, he has not closed any avenue that he showed us the ways we can go, but left all the doors open. Yes, and uh, that's what we are about: yes. opening the doors for you to walk down the line with your own thoughts, questions, and seek answers. And some of us will be there helping you down that, down that road. Uh, we will, I can assure you that we will have Professor Stickers come to the center and deliver more of those enlightening lectures. Thank you, Ken, very, very much. Uh, any questions? No, I'm probably too shy at the moment. Or you left well, the screen. Or you, you probably you can, you can go back to Illinois and say, I left the audience speechless. <laughs> yes, that's that's what 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 you did. Thank you again. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh,